Hey, what's up you guys? All here, and welcome back to the channel. I know there was a bit of break between now and my last video, but I'm actually just recovering from COVID. All better now, and that means we can hop back into it. And for today, I actually wanted to take a video recommendation from one of your comments. I got a comment from I'm Me Who. Also super curious about stuff like how silicon rubber is made and adhesives, insecticides, etc. And that's a great idea. I think I can definitely do a video series about different types of materials and cool things in chemistry that people might not think about. And so for today, let's talk about silicon. Silicones are really cool and there's actually a difference between silicon as the element and silicones as a material, although they are related. Silicon is a really interesting element, and I've actually worked with both the elemental form and the rubber-like material form that a lot of you are familiar with, so I kind of want to break down silicone in general and dive into a bit about silicon, just the element as well. And even I might make a few slip-ups calling one silicon or silicone throughout the video because they are very similar words and I'm going to be using them a lot. But generally, um, I will try to do my best and with that, let's hop right into it. First things first, let's go over silicon, the element, before we get into silicone, polymers, rubbers, etc. because silicon is the basis for those polymeric chains. Now, silicon is element 14. It's got an atomic weight of 28.08, and it is part a, of a family of elements called the metalloids. It's sort of similar in some ways to the metals and also similar to the non-metals, and so it walks this fine line on the right side of the periodic table. Now, a lot of you may know about silicon from its use in electronics and circuit boards. It is used very widely in the electronics industry, and almost all of modern electronics are based off silicon semiconductors. Now, this uh, elemental form of silicon is very interesting because you can get it to a very high purity that's used in these electronic devices and you can do something called doping to it. You've heard about these silicon semiconductors but silicon on its own actually isn't conductive. It is just this metallic looking pretty brittle material that you can snap and get in these wafers, but it doesn't actually conduct electricity on its own. To make it conduct electricity, you actually have to dope the silicon. With this doping, you can create two different types of these silicon semiconductors, N or P type semiconductors, and these just correspond to which part of the semiconductor has free electrons, and which part of the semiconductor has holes to attract these free electrons. And using these two different materials, you can basically create these pathways on a circuit. You can create things like diodes and transistors and solar panels. There's so much you can do with it. And if you guys are interested, I can do a whole video on silicon in its elemental form and how the whole doping process works, because there's a lot of different ways and different elements you can use for it. And it's a whole subject on its own. But for now, let's get into silicone rubbers. Now, these silicone polymers, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. They're in cookware, they're used in construction. Honestly, they're used in so many different things because of their versatile and extremely useful properties, which include they have low thermal conductivity, they aren't prone to snapping, they're super pliable and not brittle, as I'm sure many of you know, and they're also pretty non-toxic as a general statement. And this means they're really useful for stuff like cooking ware. They're also water resistant, which means they can be used as sealants in places like bathrooms with caulking. Um, and these silicones are extremely useful and they're super adaptable because of how their chain works. Now, the base for these silicones starts off with the single silicon atom that is attached to an oxygen. And you have the silicon oxygen chain going all the way along depending 
how long you make this polymeric chain or if it's cyclical, and changing these different properties will also change the property on the macro scale of what the silicone rubber is. The silicon atoms that are connected to the oxygens also have two R groups. Now for those of you who don't know and maybe you haven't taken organic chemistry, an R group is whatever you decide to stick on an atom. You can stick a chain of carbons, you can stick some functionalized group with a nitrogen, etc. But an R group just means it's pretty adaptable what you can attach to this kind of base chain of polymers. And whatever you attach to these silicone uh, polymeric chain R groups will change their properties. And this makes silicones a super varied range of substances. You can have liquid lubricant silicones all the way to hard plastic-like ones, and this is super useful and super adaptable. Now, in general, with polymers, for those who are unfamiliar, the longer the chains of polymers you have, that means generally the, the harder and uh, more solid the macro scale properties of the material will be. And you can kind of think of this like a pile of headphones that you've just thrown in a bucket. If you had a bunch of little wires of these headphones about this long, it would be really hard for them to get tangled up. And they might be a lot softer of a material or maybe even a liquid. On the other hand, if you have really long headphone wires, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, and they're all thrown in a bucket together, those get tangled up and they create this very strong bond, and you can create very strong materials with these really long polymer chains. There are also other ways to create strong polymers that don't necessarily relate to polymer length, but that is one of them. Another way you can do this with these silicone polymers is on those R groups I mentioned. If you have two R groups that are attracted to each other, that means when these polymer strings are next to each other, they'll kind of pull together. This is sort of similar to how hydrogen bonds work between water molecules, except these um, functionalized groups that are attracted to each other can use a lot of different methods to be attracted to each other. And I'll also go into sort of the liquid um, polymers of these silicones. If you have these cyclical silicon polymers, you can create liquid silicones, and that's because this polymeric chain is all kind of self-contained. Imagine a bucket filled with marbles instead of these long silicon chains. And because they don't have these interchain interactions. They can't hold on to each other as tightly and that creates more liquid silicon chains. And as you can see, there's a huge variance to how these work. A lot of these liquid silicones, because of their non-toxicity and lubricating properties, are actually used in skincare products. They can be used as solvents or even as just general lubricants on you can think of things like silicone greases and all, which are very common. You can create kind of these medium silicones that maybe have kind of medium length chains or they have certain functional groups that are attracted to each other. And these can range from methyls to even longer carbon chains. And depending on how long you make these chains, both in the R groups and the silicon oxygen chain itself will depend on how strong that polymer is. And there are going to be thousands of different combinations you come up with. I can't name or show you images of all of them here, but this gives you a general idea of how these silicone rubbers work and why they have such interesting and varied properties. Now to get into how these silicones are synthesized, because you might be wondering how they make these polymeric chains. And this generally works through this one pathway using uh, halogens. Now, what I mean by this is you need to start off with your base building block of a polymer. And you see here, it sort of starts off with the silicon molecule, the two R groups that you want attached in your polymer chain. And instead of it being a long chain, you kind of have a self-contained structure here with two chlorine atoms sticking off the end. Now, to actually turn this into our long silicone polymer, you want to 
add water and basically do a hydro hydrolysis reaction, which is just adding water into this molecule. And this creates the process of creating those long silicone chains, and this is where you get your oxygen in that you saw earlier in these long chains. And there are a couple of different ways to kind of create these chains, and depending on your R groups, it might dictate what happens with these and what properties you get in the end. Depending on the amount of reactants, the temperature, and dozens of other variables, you can dictate how long that these chains form before the reaction ends, if they create cyclical silicones, etc. But this is kind of a very common thing in polymer chemistry, we're changing these little variables or maybe adding a catalyst will change how long a reaction goes for, how long you make these chains, etc. And then you end up with whatever silicone that you want with whatever properties you want. And the one super adjustable thing about these are those two R groups that will do a lot to dictate the properties of said silicone. All of these different things we've covered today together make silicone an insane material and a really cool breakthrough in chemistry and material science, and it's evident by how we use silicone almost every day, from our cooking to our bathroom grouts and um, caulking. And that's really cool how you can see chemistry's impact on the real world. If you guys like these kind of more deep dives into specific materials, let me, don't know, let me know down below. And I hope you guys liked the video. Be sure to comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.